We're singing these songs this morning. And there's so many things in my heart. God gave me a message the other night. I'm going to be primarily in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy this morning. God gave me a sovereign word. With the Lord's help, I'm going to minister this word to you this morning. I know that it was for me. It's been quite some time since God spoke to me this way and my eyes were so open to see something so clearly and so simple. I'm amazed at the effort of God and the desire of God to want to be with us. I'm amazed at that. I'm not the first to be amazed. I sure won't be the last. What has to be the most beloved song in Christendom on this earth is Amazing Grace. Because it just really is amazing. What amazes me as much as that is how negligent we are with his desire. Please just let me say what God told me. Um, God created us different than he created anything else. Created in His image to bear His glory. He created us with a special design to be uniquely related to Him in an intimacy like no other part of God's creation can enjoy. Not to the angels or to any other facet of God's creation. Has God so placed within another creation that he has made like man with the emotions? And God's not emotional, but he has emotion and he has passion and he has love and he has desire. And if he didn't, there would be no love because love can be grieved. But he created us with emotions in order to relate to him. We have a sense of justice. That sense of justice in us is the image of God. His likeness. We have a feeling of jealousy. We have an understanding of loyalty. These things are the image or the likeness of God. It is in that capacity... That God has made us for the purpose that God may enjoy a unique intimacy with us like no other part of his creation. And the sad legacy is, is from creation. The whole biblical history that we have is that man has trashed this image And he has ignored this God. Psalm 53. It says that God looked down upon the sons of man to see if any understood. But they've all turned away backwards. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. For they have not sought the Lord. They have not sought him. And in spite of us not seeking God. Amazingly, God has sought us. Amazing. I don't understand it. I really, I know me too well. I don't even have to get into you. I don't know why he'd seek me. I really don't. But he does. When the first man fell in the garden, it was God who came. It wasn't man who cried for God, but it was God who cried for man. And he walked in the garden with the man, and the man had fallen in his sin. 
And with all of the tenderness and all of the love, yet all of the holiness and justice of this God, he found a way, not in that moment, but before he ever created, he found a way to redeem that man. And at the expense of an animal that God slew, he took the skins from that animal and he covered the man. And from that moment with man, you find that God intensely pursues humanity with passion, with fervor. He pursues us. He has sought out unique ways to reveal himself to us. He has done marvelous things, powerful things in his creation, powerful displays of his love every day. As a matter of fact, he said in his word that he shows his mercy and his goodness upon the just and the unjust to everyone. And his compassions are new every morning and they never fail. Never. Amazing what God does. It is amazing. Not what we stumble over every day of our life. It is amazing what we totally ignore every day of our life. I'm preaching to me. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. We ignore every day of our life. The mercy of God, fresh and new every morning. The mercy of God is the desire of God, which disposes him or commits him to go out of his way to do something good on your behalf. God, this heavenly God, absolutely holy and perfect to a creation that practically ignores him since its inception, goes out of his way every single day of your life to do something good for you and for me. That's amazing. And what's more amazing is how oftentimes what he does goes ignored by us. That's amazing to me. So God eventually gets a nation of people. He has desired this people because through them the Messiah will come. He's anxious for this day of the Messiah's coming. But everything has to be right. It has to be the right moment and the right time that he comes. And in order for nobody to miss the coming of the Messiah, he's going to give 4,000 years of rehearsals to Israel. He's going to give 4,000 years of rehearsals to man. So that when the Messiah comes, nobody will miss him. Everyone will know this is the one. This is God in the flesh who has come to us. And so... With Israel, God brings a nation together and he says, I, I want to live right in the middle of you. I want to be in the center of all of you and I want you all around me and I want you with me. It's the same type of heart that Jesus had when he fell before Jerusalem and he said, how I have longed to take you under my wings, how I've wanted this so badly. But Israel, you have refused me. The longing of God. The passionate heart of God. And so God takes Israel and he says, I want to be right in the very center of you. And I want you all around me. And in order for this to happen, there's going to have to be an incredible price that is paid. Because you're such an unholy people. And in my wrath, I would, I would destroy all of you because of your sinfulness. But I'm going to make an allowance and, and I am going to allow for millions upon millions of innocent animals to be slain in your place. And their blood is going to run like a river throughout Israel so that I can just simply dwell with you a people and you will be my people and I will be your God. And I want that so badly. And there's going to be a tent and a temple constructed. And within that, as we have just been singing, there's going to be a gate, only one. 
And there's going to be courts and there's going to be a holy place. And deep behind the holy place is going to be a holy of holies. And I am going to dwell right there, Israel, in that holy of holies. And I'm going to be among you and I'm going to be your God. And you are going to be my people. And I don't want you to worship any other gods. And I don't want you to serve any other gods. And I don't want you to create any gods. And I don't want you to even create graven images unto me. Because you can't do it and I don't want you worshiping anything. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And I want to be with you. And Israel threw it away. They threw it away. They rejected God. They chose false gods. The glory departed from Israel. Israel fell into captivity because of her whoredoms. And running after idolatries and God's here and God's there. And brought the whole nation into sin and she threw God away. And provoked God to jealousy. But God never gave up. Isn't he wonderful? And he fulfilled his promise. And he came. He himself came. And before he ever came, he knew exactly what we would do to him. And he came. And he laid aside power. He laid aside everything. And he became a man. Still God. But he became a man. And he lived among us. Dependent upon his heavenly father. And for power dependent upon the Holy Ghost. And he walked in this world. And he lived in this world. And he lived in this life. For one purpose, that I may die so you can live, and I'll become poor so you can become rich, and I will take your sin so that you will be able to take my righteousness, and I'm doing this all for you, so that you, listen, so that you may be With me. I want you. I want you with me. I don't want you in the clan. I don't want you in the movement. I don't want you in the religion. I want you with me. I died and rose that you might be with me. Now. Right now. Today. In that body, in that pew, on this earth, with me now and forevermore. I did it for that. I, did, I passionately pursued you. When you didn't love me, I loved you. And many of you this morning loved me only because I loved you. And when you were sinners... I died for you. When you were lost and you couldn't find your way, I found you. I came to you. When you were thrown aside in your sins and all of the law of God was upon you, demanding your death and your damnation, I redeemed you. I bought you. I cleansed you. I renewed you for me. Not so you will escape hell, but that you might be with me. And I think, I think about the effort of this God to be with me. Me as an individual, you've said it, I've said it. If you're the only one, he'd have died for you. The effort of this God to be with me, the effort of this God to be with you, and think. How little we stir ourselves up to be with this God. Think of how Little, we stir ourselves up to be with such a loving, passionate God.
I want to talk to you this morning about the jealousy of God. I have never in my life heard a message on it. Never. You may have. I'm not saying you haven't. I haven't. The other night, deep into the night, the Holy Spirit called me. I went into my office. I sat before the Lord. And he opened my eyes to his jealousy. And he told me to tell you this this morning. So I do. In Exodus 20, verse 3. I don't know why we do not hear more about God's jealousy. Maybe because jealousy is a negative word to us. We have a hard time considering the fact that God would be jealous because we think it's negative. Maybe it's just a fearful thing to touch. But in Exodus 20, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them. Nor serve them. For I the Lord your God. Am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But listen to this wonderful verse. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And that thousands is not just numbers of people, it's generations upon those that love him. In Exodus 34... Verse 14... For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 24. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. It's impossible for us to hear the fact that God is a consuming fire and a jealous God and not understand that there is so much passion in this God like you could never understand. You could never fathom the passion, the love, the desire, the emotion that is in God. Oftentimes, God's not pictured that way. Even in our minds. We tend to picture God with a very cool reserve. If you want me, take me. If you don't, you don't. You go to hell. But that's not the passion of God. That is not the heart of this God. He's a consuming fire because He is fire. And He's jealous. His name's jealous. It's my name. Call me jealous. We shy away from this because if somebody accused, well, you're just jealous. No, I'm not. I'm not jealous. Well, God would say, yes, I am. I'm jealous. I am a jealous God. My name is jealous. Don't provoke me to jealousy. I will burn with wrath. That's what he says. You read it. Read around Exodus. Read around Deuteronomy, these passages, and you will see it very clearly. If you provoke me to jealousy, I will burn with wrath. I will burn with it. That's what the Holy Spirit was showing me. 
You do not want to provoke me to jealousy. Now, I want to define jealousy to you for a minute. I want you to understand that when the Bible says that God is jealous and that his name is jealous, there is no other word for jealous that is describing God. There is a different word for jealous when it refers to people. But it's still built upon the same Hebrew structure of the word. Which they tell us, as far as scholars do, that every passion, every intensity is there. But there's one difference in it that makes God's jealousy different than the jealousy of man. And so let me describe this to you. Man's jealousy is a feeling of resentment against someone because of that person's rivalry being his success and his advantage over another. You see, we get jealous with each other because you're more successful than me. We get jealous with each other because you have more advantage than I do. And I want your success. I want your advantage. I want to be you. I want to have what you have. But God doesn't have that kind of jealousy. Because there is nothing in all of creation that has any success but God. And nothing has advantage over God. Nothing. Not Satan, the kingdoms of hell, nothing does. And so God's jealousy is different even when God sees precious things that he loves dearly in the hands of evil. He is not jealous in the way that we are. He is jealous because he knows that the path that this evil is taking you is straight to damnation. Straight to to, to a life of calamity and disaster. Because there's no advantage in it. There's no success in it. It's all a lie. And God knows it. And only God has advantage. Only God has success that brings life and joy. God knows that. And so it's for the good of man. Not the type of jealousy that we have. Now the Hebrew word for jealous here is... I can't even try to pronounce it. But anyway, this is what it means. Zeal. And zeal is the excitement of mind... Fervor of spirit, excitement for a person, excitement for somebody, a contentious rivalry. Now, listen to this a sexual passion and anger. Now, all of those are the Hebrew foundation and root of the word jealous. And because this word jealous describes God is found nowhere else with any other human in the description of it, even in the sexual passion. The the purpose of that in regards to God's jealousy is this, that God has excitement for you, not the type of an excitement that a man may have for a woman in that type of sexual passion or out of place lust. But that sexual passion is the description of. Of the highest intimacy two people can enter. The highest intimacy. The deepest intimacy. The strongest of unions comes in that sexual passion. And God is using this word to describe his jealousy. That what I have for you, the intimacy that I desire with you, goes beyond that. It goes beyond that which man and a woman could enjoy. It goes beyond that. The intimacy is greater. And that's why Jesus would come into the earth and he would say, If you do not love me more than you love your wife and your children, you can't follow me. Because there's something deeper in Christ. There's something stronger. There's something that's more intimate, more passionate, more real, more loving, more enduring than the strongest of human affections. A contentious rivalry. A contentious rivalry. That's what jealousy is. A contentious rivalry. Well, when you read in the Old Testament and you see where God describes jealousy, and he talks about, don't provoke me to jealousy. I am a jealous God. My name is jealous. Don't go whoring after other gods. Don't create graven images. Don't worship. When you come into their land, you tear all of their altars down. You burn their images. You get rid of everything because I don't want you to worship any of these gods because I am jealous. And trust me, you don't want to stir up my jealousy for you because there's a contention. There is a rivalry. And the rivalry is this, that there are two great beings in this universe 
that are contending for your affection. Two great ones. We in our civilized culture do not worship the, the idols like we would say they did in the, in the pagan days and so forth. The wood and the stones and the graven images. But let's not be fooled to the fact that there are many gods that we will at any day fall down to and worship. You see, Satan is after your affections. That's why John said in his epistle, don't love this world. Don't you love it? Don't love the things that are in it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life. If any man loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. It is the world that Satan uses to draw your affection. And there is a rivalry for your affection. And Satan is doing everything he can to draw your affection to himself. And just think of what it does to God when he sees his redeemed children falling on their faces with more affection to the gods of this world than to the God of heaven. Just think about it. Think about the offense of God. Think how God, think about this God that we love. Think of how humiliated he is. When we put more affection into things, we get more excited about things than we do about God. Think of how humiliated he is. He's jealous for you. There is a rivalry after your affections. And when we fall down with more excitement to the gods of this world and the things that this world can give us, and we're more excited about that, It stirs the jealousy of God. He's humiliated. And why shouldn't he be? It's embarrassing to him. It stirs up anger in him. He's offended. Because God has a passion and a longing for intimacy with you that could go deeper than anything else. And he knows that all of those things are vanity. And they lead to vanity and they're empty deceits. That are not fulfilling, but I am the fountain of living water. I will satisfy you and I will so fill you. The jealousy of God burns within him as he watches us on any given moment of any given day. How excited we get. Every one of us about things. And we never get that excited about God. And he's jealous for you. The excitement that we show in a ball game. Over the excitement that we show to God in a house of worship. Humiliates him. That's what he told me. Our excitement about things compared to our excitement about God humiliates me. Because I'm jealous. I want you to be excited about me like that. I want you to love me like that. I created you to love me like that. I have pursued you to love me like Just listen to the wail of God as he spoke to Israel through Jeremiah. What iniquity have you found in me? Israel, what have I done? What one thing have I done to you to make you leave me and go after other gods? Be astonished, heavens. Be horrified, creation. Because Israel has done something that has never been done before. They have traded me, the fountain of living waters, for broken cisterns that do not satisfy. What have I done? What have I done? You haven't given me a chance. You haven't allowed me the privilege. You haven't given me the opportunity. I'm jealous for it. I long for it. I want it. With all of my heart, I want it. I burn for you. I pursue you everlastingly to be with me. 
Does this mean that we can't get excited about things? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean that. Does it mean that God does not want us to show pleasure and joy in the things of life? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all. Does it mean that God does not want me to passionately, emotionally, excitedly, devotedly love my wife? No, He wants me to. He wants me to love her with passion, with endearment, with emotion, with, with everything that I can. He, he loves to see me love her like that. But He wants me to come to Him every day and thank Him for giving her to me. That's what it is. Does it mean that God does not want to see us and our kids get excited about snow? No. He loves to see us excited about it. He brought Israel into the promised land. You know what he was telling them? Listen, listen, this is what I've prepared for you. Listen, Israel, I'm bringing you to a land. It is overflowing. I'm so excited. I can't wait to give it to you. It's going to be wonderful. It's got vegetables. It's got fruit. It's got the grapes are so huge. It's overflowing with milk and honey. You're going to live in homes you didn't even have to build. You're going to eat from gardens you didn't even plant. Now I'm giving it to you. I'm so excited. Do you think he wanted them to enter into the promised land? (laughs) He wanted them to look at it. He was thrilled when they carried those grapes on sticks back to the Israel as they were showing them, this is what waits for us in our promise. And to see the, he was excited about, he loved to see the enthusiasm on the faces of his people. But what do you think he wanted? What do you think would be the proper response when Israel would enter into their first home that they didn't have to build and eat their first fruit from a garden they didn't have to plant? He wanted them on their knees giving thanks to a God who's so bountiful. God, this came from you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you for the joys of life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my children. Thank you for my health. Thank you, God, for joy. Thank you for blue skies. Thank you for sunshiny days. Thank you, God. This is the day you've made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. It all should make everything return back to God. Everything. You know, it's like it's like giving candy to a baby. I'm not talking about the evil of manipulation. But you see, sometimes some elderly person give candy to a baby. Why do they do it? Because they're wanting to show this baby that I'm kind and I'm friendly. They're trying to show this baby who would be afraid of some stranger that they don't know, maybe in the church. But this person in the church just wants to minister to them and wants to love them. Wants to try to get to know them as somebody within the body. And they give them some candy and they just show friendliness. They show love. They show a desire for friendship. And what does that little baby know? Well, I'm going to them for candy again. Because they gave me candy. But And that person just continues to give and that person continues to give. And eventually a relationship is built between that individual and that little child. And it can be a very precious relationship because somehow it gets past the candy to the person. And that's what God is doing. I've given you so many things to enjoy. Satan doesn't give it to you. Listen, gifts come from everywhere. But the only perfect gift in which there is no shadow, no sting, no pain comes from your heavenly Father. And when it comes from me, I just want you to return to me and thank me with it. And thank me for it. It's like the engagement where a man who loves a woman so so passionately that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her. And he has planned and he has premeditated the moment of inviting her and asking her to marry him and be joined to him for the rest of their lives. And he plans this really romantic evening. And everything is just right. And the right moment comes for him to, to pose the question to her. And he pulls the little box out and she opens the box and she sees the ring. What should be the response in case it happens to you? You can say... Ah, are you going to, oh, it's beautiful. I can't believe it. Is this, is this really real? Is this really for me? And then quickly put the box aside because it's not the ring you're marrying. And get into his arms and love him. 
But God gives us those rings. And we become more infatuated with the ring than we do with God. And He's jealous. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for me. It's amazing what God goes through. It's amazing what He goes through. By every one of us. The pain we put Him in. The embarrassment we put Him in. The humiliation. Not that we can't be excited and have fun and love to see children laugh and love to play and love to see. But God, He gets the worst of our moments, doesn't He? He gets your prayer time when you're half asleep laying on your bed at night when your day's over. Or he gets those groggy moments with you in the morning when you can't hardly stay awake because you just can't get going. And then you're busy about your day with your work and doing all of the things that you need to do. Always intending to spend some time with God. But it's amazing how the day flies and the time passes and all of the demands that come. And oh God, I'm here with you tonight. And God, I just want to tell you how much I... I want to tell you how much I love you, God. And I just want to tell you how much I'm thankful for. And we just don't give him the quality. I'm embarrassed about myself. Because the Holy Spirit really opened my eyes to this. He really showed me how jealous God is for me. Maybe you're embarrassed too. If you should be, then be. Don't try to excuse it. God has a wrath, guys. And He's jealous for you. And when we have more affection for this world and these goofy things than we do about God... When we can pump ourselves up to get excited about a game and we can't stir ourselves up to get excited about God, God help us. Here's what I want you to understand. Listen to this in Deuteronomy chapter 5. It just shows this with Israel. This is when the mountain was on fire and it was quaking and God was there. Listen to what Israel says. Verse 24, and you said, this is the, and God's saying this, Israel, you said, you said this, behold, are you reading it? Verse 24, Deuteronomy 5, I want you to see it. And you said, behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God does talk with man and he lives. But you know what they did rather quickly? Flip over, if you would, to Deuteronomy 32. And look what they did. You want to try to just imagine how humiliated God was? If you've ever had a spouse walk out on you, if you've ever had a friend betray you, if you ever trusted somebody that failed you, if you've then you are touching it, but you can't conceive the depth of it. I don't care what you've been through. Deuteronomy 32, verse 16. Now, they said in chapter five who he was, that he's alive and he speaks. But they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. Provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed to devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers didn't even fear. Of the rock that begot you, you are unmindful 
and have forgotten God that formed you. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. My God. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation. Children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. And I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. That's it. But oh, how merciful God is. Because Psalm 78 says, But He, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yes, many times He turned His anger away and did not stir up all His wrath. Oh, God. Do you hear that? Oh, what a God, what an awesome, awesome God He is. How many times He turned His anger away and didn't stir up His wrath because He doesn't want to. What does He want? He wants to love you. He wants to be with you. If we foolishly go after these things, do we have any idea what we're bringing on to our children and grandchildren and children's children? God said to the generations, I'll be after them if you provoke me to jealousy. But if you will walk with me and love me, then I will be merciful upon thousands of your generations. What a promise. What a glorious promise. What does God want? What does God want from all this? Hebrews eleven six. That you must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want to conclude with this. Because this is the point that we have to get. Please listen to me. Every one of you this morning, please listen. You have to stir yourself up to take hold of God. You have to do it. I don't care how you were raised. Some of the most God awful things have happened to people who were brought up in the church. Because they worship like Baptists or they worship like Catholics or they worship like Pentecostals. And the Holy Spirit has the most difficult time breaking through the traditionalism of it. Even if it's Pentecostal. I don't care what you're like. I don't care what your nature is. I'm expressive. I'm not expressive. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I don't want you to worship like me. I don't care to worship like you. There's only one thing that I want to desire in my heart. I want to see God. I don't want to come into a group of people and say we were in church. My God, I want to enter your presence. Take me past the outer courts. Take me past the people who are just standing around singing God. Take me past it all. And bring me into the courts, God, where I see your face. Oh, God, bring me there. And I don't care who judges me. I don't care what they think. I get to see God. And that doesn't happen automatically. You have to stir yourself up to do it. And any man is capable. Any man is capable of it. Because of the way you're created. You're a human. You're made for that. Don't tell me you can't. Sometimes it's the flesh that's so strong that just won't let us. Because the Spirit of God in us, we've, we haven't been filled with Him. We haven't been strengthened by Him. We don't worship in spirit and in truth. We worship with our peers and how they're all doing it. I've had people say, I just wanted to shout and jump. Why, why, why didn't you? People say, I wanted to run. Why didn't you? I wanted to come into the altars and worship God. during. The, why didn't you? Because as Baptists, we didn't do that. Or because as Catholics, that's not the way it was. Or because of Methodism, that's how it was. Or because of Pentecostalism, that's what does it matter? Do you want to see God? Will you let the Holy Spirit lead you? Can you stir yourself up? This is all he wants. I want you to believe that I am. And I reward everyone who diligently seeks me. No diligence, 
no reward. If you want the reward, be diligent. What does that mean? Go beyond what other people are willing to do. Don't make a fool of yourself. Don't make a show. Don't try to do some emotional, carnal, pep thing. But stir yourself up to take hold of God. Every human is capable. You were divinely created with the ability. No other creature can but you. And we must. There are many ways of stirring ourselves up. I think about David. Who said, there's only one desire that I have in my life. Well, how many do you have? Some of you come to church and we think about dinner. That's following. David fought that. David didn't live in the day of the saints. New Orleans saints, that is. But I'm sure he may have had some chariot races after church one day. I don't know. But his desire was to sit in the temple of God and to behold his beauty. That's my desire. That is the longing of my soul. And he prayed. He prayed often, Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. God, it is so easy for me to get divided. Please, God, don't let that happen to me. And David, look at him. He's a pro at this. He knows what he's talking about. And read his Psalms, how often he commanded himself to bless the Lord. He didn't feel like it. He's the king of Israel. He's a military genius. He's fought battles. Don't tell me what it's like to be tired. David knew what tired was. He knew what fatigue was. He knew what injuries were. He's been in battle. He's been hit. He's been fought. He's he's making decisions. He's up all night with kingly affairs. But he comes into the house of God and he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His name. How dare you sit here downcast and frustrated. The Lord is your, the light of your countenance. Rise up and bless Him. And he stirred himself up. No wonder he's the worshiper of God. No wonder he's the great psalmist. No wonder he took hold of him. No wonder he said one thing of I desire. No wonder he said in Psalm 63, your love and kindness is better than life. No wonder he said he touched something that most people never get close enough to. I think about the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 who said that I only live to apprehend that for which I've been apprehended. Oh, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. That's all I want to know. I don't want to know what songs they're singing today. I don't want to know what anybody's dressed like. I don't want, I want to know Christ. And I want that preacher to preach Him crucified. I want to know Christ. And that was it. And these men knew God. It's like Mary, who broke into the house and opened up her alabaster box of oil and she poured everything she had upon Jesus Christ. What worship, oh my God. Or what about the other Mary who broke into the house and fell down upon Jesus' feet and she washed His feet with her tears and with her hair. Yeah, that's the worship I'm talking about. The stirring up ourselves. The stirring up. But only the person who believes that He is will do it. Only the person that believes He'll reward will do it. There are many ways we stir ourselves up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, you ought to pray in in your tongues. You ought to do it. Because it edifies the inner man. You come into church. And look, you come tired. Come with a headache. Maybe you're up late Saturday night. Or maybe this is even in your own prayer closet on a Monday morning. Pray in tongues. Just take some time and just begin to pray in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14 says your inner man is going to be edified. Take advantage of it and stir yourself up. Worship God in spirit and truth. The Bible says sing. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing to God. Well, nobody else is singing. So what? Don't sing like a solo so everybody can hear you, but sing. So God will hear you. Sing. Make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing to Him. Worship Him. 
Pray to Him. Walk with Him. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can be. He offers that. Be filled with the Spirit of God. And stir yourself up to take hold of God. Cry out to God. And rejoice in Him that He is God. Well, I just don't feel very happy today. Well, rejoice in God and you will before you go home. Well, what do I have to rejoice in? That He's the living God and He wants to redeem your life and He wants to heal you from all your diseases. He wants to give you wisdom for all of your confusion and He wants to give you power over all of your enemies. My my God, can't you thank Him for that? Rejoice in the Lord because He's God. Because He's God, rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in garbage six days a week. We found the slightest thing that this world can throw us on any given day so we can have a little bit of happiness And God is there every moment and wants us to just absolutely adore Him. And He adores us. Can you believe it? He adores us. God is jealous for you. And we ought to be a people who are jealous for God. And we ought to stir ourselves up. You know, Elijah was jealous for God. And we ought to stir ourselves up. And we ought to be a people who are determined to take hold of God. I'm not saying you're not. I'm not judging you as individuals. I'm just telling you what the Holy Spirit told me to say. Take hold of God. Believe that He is. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I'm not asking you to come like me. And I'm not going to be intimidated to come like you. But there is a Spirit of God who wants to bring me into the presence of Jesus. And I can be with Him. And I want to be with Him. Stand with me. D, if we can sing that, take me past the outer courts. And listen, I want to read this to you. Just be still for a moment. Listen to this. Just listen to it. And I'm not asking you to do this today. I'm asking you to pray that the Holy Spirit will work something in you so that this becomes your life. A person who stirs themselves up to be with God, who recognizes the love of God. For thus saith the Lord, unto those that keep my Sabbaths, now listen, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even to them, Will I give my house and within my walls a place and a name? I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of the stranger, that's us, that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant, even them will I bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. If you'll love me, this is what he said, if you'll love me, if you will love my ways, if you will serve me, if you will choose what pleases me, I will make you joyful. And I will make you happy in my house of prayer. Oh, God, isn't that wonderful? And in the book of Acts, when he came, when Paul came, And had seen the grace of God. He was glad. And he exhorted them all. And I do to you. That with purpose of heart. You would cleave unto the Lord. With purpose of heart. Cleave unto the Lord. Don't take this casually. Cleave to him. With all of your heart. Let's worship. Let's give God what he deserves. To fall before.